Well, hello, YouTube. This is Brett Norman, and today is October 19, 2015. And let's see, I've uh, been pretty busy, and I uh, just thought I'd get back on here and, and record another chapter of The Secret Terrace by Bill Hughes. And now we're on chapter three, and... Um, I guess uh, now might be a good time to just uh, quick give a word of thanks and support to Tom Fress there from Inquisition Update and his book that uh, or the book that he is reviewing and um, giving us his wonderful insights on uh, right now is the Global Vatican. And as uh, you might know, uh, I have been active with the show the hour of the truth on your glissman's or yerk glissman's channel rather and that's uh joggler 66 on youtube and um i just wanted to uh quick uh give my support and a word of thanks to them for their continued work uh, in the field of exposing the papacy and um, reflecting upon current events of today. And uh, so with that being said, um, I uh, will continue my reading here, chapter 3, and I'll start from the top here. And the title of this chapter is Presidents Harrison, Taylor, and Buchanan. Okay, so from the top, William Henry Harrison was elected to the presidency of the United States in the year 1841. He was already well up in years at 67, but he was very healthy and robust. All who knew him felt that he would have no problem going through his full four years in office. However, just 35 days after taking the oath of office, President Harrison was dead on April 4, 1841. Most, if not all, encyclopedias will tell you that he died of pneumonia after having his inaugural address in the severe cold of Washington, D.C. But that is incorrect. He did not die of pneumonia. When Harrison came to office, a very tense situation existed in the country. Trouble was brewing between the North and South over the issue of slavery. There was contention over the annexation of Texas, whether it would be admitted free or slave. An attempt had been made on President Jackson's life just six years before. Harrison took office a short 20 years before this, the Civil War. The influence of the Jesuits was weighing heavily upon America. As we have already seen, the Congress at Vienna, Verona, and Cherry were determined to destroy popular government wherever it was found. The prime target was the United States and the destruction of every Protestant principle. The despicable Jesuits were ordered to carry out this destruction. Andrew Jackson faced the onslaught of the Jesuits via the political minefields of John C. Calhoun and the financial wizardry of Nicholas Biddle. William Henry Harrison had also refused to go along with the Jesuits. The Jesuits' goals for America, that is. In his inaugural address, he made these comments, quote, We admit of no government by divine right, believing that so far as power is concerned, the beneficent creator has made no distinction among men, that all are upon an Equal, equal, equality, and that the only legitimate right to govern is upon the expressed grant of power from the governed. Burke McCarty, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. By that statement, President Harrison 
had just incurred the deadly wrath of the Jesuits. Quote, With these unmistakable words, President Harrison made his position clear. He hurled defiance to the divine right enemies of our popular government. Burke McCarty is talking about Rome when he says that. I, he did more for those who were the words that signed his death warrant. Just one month and five days from that day, President Harrison lay a corpse in the White House. He died from arsenic poisoning administered by the tools of Rome. The Jesuit oath had been swiftly carried out, unquote. And if you don't know the Jesuit oath, here it is, quote, I do further promise and declare that I will, when opportunity presents, make and wage relentless war secretly or openly against all heretics, Protestants, and liberals as I am directed to do to extirpate to extirpate them and exterminate them from the face of the earth, that when the same cannot be done openly, I will use secretly the poison cup, regardless of honor, rank, dignity, or authority of the person or persons whatsoever may be their condition in life, either public or private, as I am, as I at any time may be directed to do by an agent of the Pope or superior of the Brotherhood of the Holy Faith of the Society of Jesus, unquote. Yes, what a despicable oath it is. And to think that we have so many Jesuits all around us here in America is just disgusting. Okay, back from my comments here. I will continue. For nearly a thousand years, the Roman Catholic popes felt that they ruled by divine right, that their power had come directly from God, and that all men were to bow to their authority and control. If a ruler would not submit his position at the country he ruled into the hands of the Pope, then that person had no right to rule. When Harrison stated that, quote, we admit of no government by divine right, unquote, he was declaring that he and the United States were in no way going to submit to the Pope's control. To the Pope and his heinous Jesuits, this was a slap in the face that they felt must be dealt with immediately. It was not Harrison alone that had rejected Rome's authority, for he was simply stating what the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution had declared before him. Our Republic totally refused the control that the Pope and the Jesuits were trying to apply. When a nation, church, or individual refuses to submit to the authority of the papacy, they are finished. Unless God intervenes, the lives of those opposing the papacy will be terminated. This concept is completely foreign to the thinking of people who have lived under a free constitutional government. The inalienable rights to government without a king. Oh, I'm sorry. Let me start that over, that last sentence. The inalienable rights to worship God according to the dictates of one's own conscience and a government without a king are taken for granted in the United States today. Oh my, oh my, aren't they ever taken for granted? Okay. I mean, uh, I got to make some comments here. I mean, uh, wow. Uh, I just watched a video today, and I'm very, very tempted to mirror this video and put it up on my channel it is called uh it might be sunday or it was sunday what was the name of that video quick uh see if i got it up here on um, it's uh maybe on sunday by james uh aberito 
or I can't pronounce his name right now. But anyway, yeah, excellent, excellent video. Um, just really, really good points about Sunday Law in that video. And, uh, you know, kind of goes into the fine details of uh, Exodus and uh, chapter 20, verse 8, eight of course. And, uh, wow, just really, really good video to think about. So... You know, and, and we really need to start questioning uh, Christians that are around us, close to us every day. I work with some Christians, and and I'm definitely, you know, telling them as much as I can, as much as I can handle telling them I try. You know, I'm not the most brilliant bulb on the tree, but, uh, you know, you got to give it a shot. That's all I'm saying, you know, and and uh you know god put us here for a reason if we don't use our voice and start uh reaching out to other people and questioning their beliefs as well as christians you know we need to come together to the knowledge of the truth and you know and sometimes we fall short and i am not the only one to fall short i'll tell you i'm definitely with you people out there on that i mean we're just we got to help each other out and that's one of the reasons I'm doing this reading tonight and I'm trying to approach this really positively just like everyone else so um, I'll go back to that sentence again we'll continue the inalienable rights to worship God according to the dictates of one's own conscience and a government without a king are taken for granted in the United States today we don't realize that Harrison's statement was a dagger aimed at the heart of the papacy's existence. Another ruler who refused to be dictated to by the papacy was the Queen Elizabeth of England. She was one of Henry VIII's daughters and ruled England from 1558 to 1603. She ascended the throne following the death of her half-sister, Bloody Mary, who ruled England from 1553 to 1558. Mary had been a Catholic sovereign, but Elizabeth was a Protestant. Quote, After her ascension, Elizabeth wrote Sir Richard Crane, the English ambassador in Rome, to notify the people of her ascension. But she was informed by his holiness, quote unquote, that England was a fife, servant or slave, of the quote unquote Holy See, that Elizabeth had no right to assume the crown without his permission, that she was not born in lawful wedlock, and could not therefore reign over England that her safest course would or excuse me was to renounce all claims to the throne and submit herself entirely to his will then he would treat her as tenderly as possible but if she refused his advice he would not spare her she declined the pope's advice and the hatred of Pius and his successors was assured. J. C. Shepherd, J. E. C. Shepherd, the Babington Plot, Wittenberg Publications. Queen Elizabeth wisely rejected the assumed divine right of the papacy to rule over and control the throne of England. Because of this, there was there were at least five attempts to assassinate her. These attempts all failed because she had a superb secret service group, and her life was saved. When the papacy realized that all their efforts to assassinate Elizabeth had failed, they turned on one of their Catholic sons, Philip II of Spain. In 1580, the papacy arranged for Spain to invade England. Quote, Later on, it was Pope Sixtus X who promised Philip of Spain a million scudi to assist in equipping his invincible armada to destroy 
the throne of Elizabeth. And the only condition the Pope made in the bestowment of his gift, he should have the nomination of the English sovereign and that the kingdom should become a fief of the church, unquote. The famous Spanish Armada was sent to crush England because Elizabeth would not give her throne and kingdom to the Pope. For 30 years, the Jesuits tried to kill Elizabeth but failed. Finally, they conspired with Philip II of Spain to annihilate her with the Armada. Quote, we charge the popes of the succession with being the prime movers in the entire adult life of Elizabeth to deliberately destroy her and her kingdom, forcing England's return to the domination of their evil enslaving system called the Roman Catholic Church. Not only was the Pope the prime mover of the seditious intrigues in England, but he was the mainspring of the ongoing treachery. The Pope insisted on exercising absolute authority and sovereignty over all the kings and princes and dared to assume the prerogatives of deity in wielding his spiritual and temporal swords." Unquote. Likewise, as William Henry Harrison took his oath to become the President of the United States, the Jesuits saw a man that openly opposed them and their plans. Unfortunately, President Harrison was poisoned just 35 days into his term of office. Quote, General Harrison did not die of natural disease, no failure of health or strength existed, but something sudden and fatal. He did not die of apoplexy, that is a disease, but arsenic would produce a sudden effect and it would also be fatal from the commencement. This is the chief weapon, the medical assassin, of the medical assassin, oxalic acid, prusuic acid, or salts of stritrine would be the most insistent death. I'm sorry, the most instant death. And would give but little advantage for escape to the murderer. Therefore, his was not the case of acute poisoning when the death takes place almost insta instantaneously, but of chronic, where the patient dies slowly. He lived about six days after he received the drug. John Smith died the adder's den. United States Senator Thomas Benton concurs, quote, There was no failure of health or strength to indicate such an event or to excite apprehension that he would not go through his term with the same vigor with which he had commenced it. His attack was sudden and evidently fatal from the commencement, unquote. Senator Thomas Benton, 30 Years View, Volume 2. William Henry Harrison became the first president to fall victim to the Jesuits in their attempt to take over the United States, destroy the Constitution, and install the papacy as the supreme ruler in America. If any U.S. president or any other leader refused to take orders from the Jesuits, they too would be targets of the assassination. Zachary Taylor refused to go along with the destruction of America, and he was the next to fall. Taylor was known as a great military man. His friends called him Old Rough and Ready. He came to the White House in 1848, and 16 months later, he was dead. Quote, they used the invasion of Cuba as the test for President Taylor, and their plans made ready to launch their nefarious scheme in the, in the early of his administration, the early part of his administration. But from the very beginning, 
President Taylor snuffed out all hope of its consummation during his term. Burke McCarty, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Here is what would have happened if Zachary Taylor had invaded Cuba. There was a Catholic Austria, Catholic Spain, Catholic France, and England all waiting, ready to do battle with the United States of America if he had invaded Cuba. What chance would this young republic have had against the united powers of Catholic Europe at that time? The papacy well understood this, and that is why they, pursu- or they pushed Taylor so hard to invade. Taylor committed another crime against Rome. He spoke passionately about the preservation of the Union. The Jesuits were striving hard to keep, or excuse me, let's start that sentence over. The Jesuits were striving hard to split the nation in two, and the president was trying hard to keep it together. Jesuit agent John C. Calhoun visited the Department of the State and requested the president to say nothing in his forthcoming message about the Union, but Calhoun had little influence over Taylor, for after his visit, the following remarkable passage was added to Taylor's speech. Quote, Attachment to the Union of the States should be fostered in every American heart. For more than half a century, during which kingdoms and empires have fallen, This union has stood unshaken. In my judgment, its dissolution would be the greatest of calamities, and to avert that should be the steady aim of every American. Upon its preservation must depend our own happiness and that of generations to come. Whatever dangers may threaten it, I shall stand by it and maintain it in its integrity to the full extent of my obligations or the obligations imposed and power conferred upon me by the Constitution, unquote. John Smith Die, The Adder's Den. McCarty picks up the story from here, quote, There was no quibbling in this. The pro-slavery... Uh, the pro-slavery leaders had nothing to count on in Taylor, therefore they decided on his assassination. The arch plotters, fearing that suspicion might be aroused by the death of the president early in his administration, as in the case of President Harrison, permitted him to serve one year and four months when on the 4th of July, arsenic was administered to him during a celebration in Washington at which he was invited to deliver the address. He went in perfect health in the morning and was taken ill by the afternoon about 5 o'clock and died on the Monday following, having been sick the same number of days with precisely the same symptoms as was his predecessor, President Harrison. Burke McCarty, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, quote, The slave power, the Jesuits, had now sufficient reason to count him as an enemy, and his history gave them to understand that he never surrendered. Those having slavery politically committed to their care had long before sworn that no person should ever occupy the presidential chair that had opposed their schemes in the interest of slavery. They had resolved to take his life. This, the slave power, the Jesuits, understood and they determined to serve him as they had previously served General Harrison, 
and only waited a favorable, favorable opportunity to carry out their hellish intent. The celebration of the 4th of July was near at hand, and it was resolved to take advantage of that day and give him the fatal drug. John Smith died the adder's den. Unquote. Six years later, James Buchanan a Pennsylvania Democrat, was elected president. James Buchanan had wined and dined with the Southerners, and it appeared as though he would go along with their desires. Quote, The new president proved himself a decided trimmer. Although he was a northern man, he had strongly courted the Southern leaders and given them to understand that he was with them heart and soul. In short, he double-crossed them. The gentleman had had his ear to the ground, evidently, and had heard the rumble of the abolitionist wheel. He coolly informed them that he was president of the North as well as of the South. This change of attitude was indicted by his very decided stand against Jefferson Davis and his party, and he made known his intention of setting the question of slavery in the free states to the satisfaction of the people in those states. Burke McCarty, The Suppressed Truth About the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln, unquote. James Buchanan didn't have to wait long to find out what the Jesuits would do to him for double-crossing them. Quote, On Washington's birthday, Buchanan's stand became known, and the next day he was poisoned. The plot was deep and planned with skill. Mr. Buchanan, as was customary with men in his station, had a table and chairs reserved for himself and friends in the dining room at the National Hotel. The president was known to be an inadvertent tea drinker. In fact, northern people rarely drink anything else in the evening. Southern men prefer coffee. Thus, to make sure Buchanan and his northern friends, arsenic was sprinkled in the bowls containing the tea and lump sugar and set in the table where he was to sit. The pulverized sugar in the bowls used for coffee and on the other tables was kept free from the poison. Not a single southern man was affected or harmed. Fifty or sixty persons dined at the table that evening, and as nearly as can be learned, about thirty-eight, that's thirty-eight, died from the effects of the poison. President Buchanan was poisoned, and with great difficulty his life was saved. His physicians treated him understanding, understandingly from instructions given by himself as to the cause of the illness, for he understood well what was the matter. Since the appearance of the epidemic, the tables at the National Hotel have been almost empty. Have the proprietor, excuse me, have the proprietors of the hotel or clerks or servants suffered from it? If not, in what respect did their diet and accommodations differ from those of the guests? There is more in this calamity than meets the eye. It's a matter that should not be trifled with. Unquote. The New York Post, March 18, 1857. James Buchanan was poisoned and almost died. He lived because he knew that he had been given arsenic poisoning and so informed his doctors. He knew that the Jesuits poisoned Harrison and Taylor. 
the Jesuit order fulfilled their oath again, again that they would poison, kill, or do whatever was necessary to remove those who opposed their plans. From 1841 to 1857, we saw that three presidents were attacked by the Jesuits as outlined in the Congress of Vienna, Verona, and Cherry. Two died and one barely escaped. They allow nothing to stand in their way of total domination of America and the destruction of the Constitution. As they look at America, the priests of Rome have stated, quote, We are almost, I'm sorry, here, let me start again. We are also determined to take possession of the United States, but we must proceed with the utmost secrecy. Silently and patiently we must mass our Roman Catholics in the great cities of the United States, remembering that the vote of a poor journeyman, though he be covered with rags, has as much weight in the scale of powers as the millionaire Astor. And that if we have two votes against his one, he will become as powers powerless as an oyster. Let us then multiply our votes. Let us call our poor but faithful Irish Catholics from every corner of the world and gather them into the very hearts of the cities of Washington, New York, Boston, Chicago, Buffalo, Albany, Troy, Cincinnati. Under the shadows of those great cities, the Americans consider themselves a gigantic, unconquerable race. They look upon the poor Irish Catholics with supreme contempt, as only fit to dig their canals, sweep their streets, and work in their kitchens. Let no one awake those sleeping lions today. Let us pray God that they continue to sleep for years longer, waking only to find their votes outnumbered as we will turn them forever out of every position of honor, power, and profit. What will those so-called giants think when not a single senator or member of Congress will be chosen unless he has submitted to our Holy Father, the Pope. Oh boy, now I gotta make a comment here. <laughs> we just had Pontifus Maximus of the 21st century visit a joint session of Congress on September 24, 2015. And man, oh man, if there was no opposition in there. I mean, come on. I mean, just go look at that speech and tell me where the protest was in that room of congressmen and women. There was no protest. They were all united behind the Pope. If there was any protest, there was no voices heard at that event. Nothing happened. They were all clapping and standing in unison behind him. There were a few that were sitting down, but not many. Mostly, they were all applauding the Pope. What a sad day that was. And uh, I'll leave it at that. So back to the end of the chapter here. We will not elect, or we will not only elect the president, but fill and command the armies. The uh, let me start this over. Okay. Back to this quote from uh, my comment here. We will not only elect the president, but fill and command the armies, man the naives or navies, I'm sorry, and hold the keys of the public treasury. Then, yes, then we will rule the United States and lay them at the feet of the vicar of Jesus Christ, 
that he may put an end to their godless system of education and impious laws of liberty and conscience, which are an insult to God and man. Charles Chinnicky, 50 Years in the Church of Rome, Chick Publications. Unquote. When they say, quote, Vicar of Christ, unquote, they mean the Pope. All right, and this ends the reading of chapter, thir- or chapter 3, uh, The Secret Terrace. And um, yes, a uh, godless system of education, they're referring to... Uh, of, um, you know, uh, our uh, freedom of conscience and uh, our ability to, uh, to uh, outwit and outdo the uh, <laughs> Roman Catholic Church and their dogmas. So... Um, up and coming, we have Chapter 4, President Abraham Lincoln. This should be really interesting. So, yeah, I'm uh, just getting back into this book again. And I uh, just also got a quick say uh, another word of appreciation and thanks for the shows, The Hour of the Truth and uh, Inquisition Update. Uh, that pretty much concludes for today. And... Uh, Thanks again, everybody, and I'm hoping that uh, these readings can continue and we can continue to support our brethren on the front lines of truth today. So, good night and bye-bye.